Good afternoon. How are you? I'm thrilled to welcome you all on behalf of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies and the Benson Latin American Collection. I'm Charlie Hale, director of both units, and it's my charge to say a few words about the extraordinary conference that we're concluding today. This semester, I complete my 16th year as faculty member at the University of Texas. Last week, if you had asked me where I'm from, I probably would have paused and responded, Iowa. Reflecting on the conference that we just concluded, I think my response may well be different in the future. Let me share with you a few highlights. Scholars, poets, performers, policymakers, and activists <clears throat> gathered from across the United States, Mexico, and Central America to understand how the growing presence of Central Americans is transforming what it means to be Latino and Latina in the United States and transforming relations between the United States and their countries of origin. We were inspired by Father Alejandro Solalinde, who founded a shelter in Ixtepec, Oaxaca, for Central Americans making the treacherous journey through Mexican territory. Domingo Hernandez, a veteran intellectual and activist for Mayan rights in Guatemala, spoke of his work with Maya youth on the corrosive consequences when family members leave. Chingo Bling. <laughs> Chingo Bling explained how his art breaks down hurtful stereotypes of Mexicans by exploding them from within and encourages cultural curiosity by bringing together images, genres, and styles that appear to be in opposition. And then he gave us a very high energy demonstration of his art. Assemblywoman Norma Torres told us of her, her inspiring story, how she became the first Central American born state legislator who has been instrumental in representing and defending community interests, most notably in, in working together with other Latino legislators and, and, and others in California to pass the California Dream Act. Sociologists explore gender differences and how immigrants handle painful separations from their children. Political scientists scrutinize public opinion data to explain why the anti-immigrant furor has grown so strong and sought lessons for immigrant, for immigrant rights organizing today in previous campaigns of solidarity with the peoples of Central America. Poet Maya Chinchilla evoked these contrasting historical moments, the difficult, <laughs> the difficult and wonderful experience of growing up between two worlds and how her identity is grounded in both. An anthropologist explored how children of Maya immigrants in LA confront multiple displacements from their roots in Guatemala and from their ancestral indigenous culture. Literary theorists helped us to think critically about the emergent identity category, Central American Americans. Its potential to enrich, as well as the risk that it be, could become a lower tier within the broader Latino movement for collective rights, voice, and empowerment. As an anthropologist, stories often make the biggest impression on me. Sociologist Cecilia Menjivar recounted one such story of an immigrant without documents who did factory work for a number of years in Arizona until suddenly, in response to a new law, her employer called her in to fire her summarily without a last check or severance pay. So angered by this injustice, she retorted spontaneously, if you don't pay me, I will call the Migra and turn you in for having hired me in the first place.
Taken aback by her audacity, the employer backed down. She left with her pay and an added measure of dignity. The story stands as a testament to the work that lies ahead to bring our immigration policies into line with the highest principles of our nation. Which brings me back to how this conference affected me. For a few years now, Texas has been a state in which we Anglos are in the minority. Thankfully, we have avoided so far the worst of the punitive policies against this growing Latino population so evident elsewhere. This makes it possible to imagine Texas, and perhaps Austin, Texas in particular, as a beacon a showcase for how to build a society characterized by racial justice, celebration of cultural difference, and here's where Latin American studies comes in, an understanding of the profound ways, past, present, and future, in which Texas and Latin America have intertwined destinies. In this rendering, Austin will be the site for many more encounters like this one, where people from throughout the hemisphere will gather to nourish this project and to take nourishment from it. Father Solalinde evoked this image yesterday in his call for a humanist revolution in which one measure of progress would be immigrants' chances of living free from fear, violence, and deprivation. The audacious woman from Arizona added a utopian flash to help us show the way. The Texas of this image, even if it's still very much under construction, is one that, with all due respect for my Iowa upbringing, I can feel immensely proud to call home. <clears throat> And now I'm also very proud to introduce my colleague and close collaborator in what's been a historic collaboration between two uh, leading units in the University of, of Texas at Austin. Uh, CMOS, the Center for Mexican American Studies, has worked together with LILAS in putting on this conference. And I now want to uh, welcome to the podium Dr. Domino Perez, Director of the Center for Mexican and Mexican American Studies. Domino. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Friends, familia, conference goers, it's a pleasure to welcome you. As wonderful it is, as it is to stand up here in front of you, I know you're not here to listen to me. That being said, before we begin this afternoon's event, I would like for us to take a few moments to view the video clip of um, Eva's documentary entitled Latinos Living the American Dream, and this was directed and produced by Eva Longoria, and we have a short clip of that. The landscape of America is changing in a Latin way in a beautiful way and in a positive way. I'm a college student. I am a teacher. I am a soldier. The one thing I've learned from my mom is strength. When I see the Puerto Rican flag, I just like, the first instinct is just a smile. When I see the American flag, I see I see pride. I see respect. I see dreams. The American dream for me, I'm loving it right now. Doing a documentary like this, at a time like this, is important to tell the stories of the positive contributions that Latinos are making in this country, not only today, but historically. There's just so much that Latinos have done uh, for the United States of America. We choose to walk in the path of hope that our indigenous ancestors left to us. We are deeply woven into the fabric of this country. 
the positive contributions made throughout the history of time will live on because we will celebrate and remember those contributions. When we hear the word Latino, what does that mean? What does that look like? What do we stand for? What do we represent? This is what we look like, this is what we stand for, and this is who we are. Doctors, lawyers, scientists, teachers, astronauts, politicians, activists, artists, mothers, sons, and daughters, all children of God. Yes, the landscape of America is changing, and we are part of that change. These are our stories, and this is our American dream. This conference is the result of a collaboration, and so many people have gone into making this a success. And I just want to take a moment to thank the staff of LILAS and CMOS who worked so hard to pull this event off, as well as the conference attendees and the student volunteers and our special guests, our speakers, and our special guests who are joining us in the front row today. So thank all of you for making this such a wonderful conference. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to the to bring to the podium Steve Leslie, our provost, who will be introducing Ms. Longoria. So how wonderful is it to see this fabulous audience out there for this great afternoon? Uh, what a special occasion we have uh, following up a three-day conference that was, sounds like it was wonderful. I didn't get to come to the conference. I had other things going on at the university, but, uh, but it's just wonderful. And uh, what a great day we have. It's uh, wonderful to wrap up three days to celebrate a great meeting but also to celebrate what is a fabulous way to end it, end it, and that is to have Eva Longoria here with us. And I'll come back to her in just a minute. But first, let me start by giving thanks again to the Teresa Lano uh, Long Institute for Latin American Studies and also the Center for American Studies, uh, Me Mexican American Studies, both of whom uh, were engaged in sponsoring this event. And let me just say also to Charlie Hale and Domino Perez that uh, we're so fortunate to have your leadership and it's wonderful to work with you and thanks for everything you do. Uh, things are great here because of great leadership and you two are fabulous. So let's give them a round of applause. 
And, and this is the, the first real collaboration of this type, I think, isn't it, Charlie, uh, with, uh, with these two units on campus and a great success. And I think that's also a significant thing, and, a, and a, uh, there'll be much more of this with these two leaders. I, I can say that for certain going forward. Much more to come in the future. Uh, this is a first for both centers, a collaborative effort that brings scholarly attention to the increasingly intertwined lives of Latin Americans and U.S. Latinas and Latinos, and to the shared political and policy changes and challenges that uh, these experiences bring to the fore. This conference highlights the wealth of faculty talent on this topic here at UT. It is the premier Latin American studies program in the United States. A lot of talent on this campus. And we also have a large growing number of UT students who by upbringing and by halter, uh, uh, cultural heritage, as well as by their chosen areas of study, have a special connection to Latin American and Latino histories, identities, and social concerns. This campus is made up significantly of Latino students. I just uh, checked to get the most accurate data, and, and we're at about 17.6% Latino students right now uh, with uh, last year's class, and that's growing. The entering class will be right at about 19%, and so we're gonna keep focusing on that that, that is expanding on, on campus. And UT is an ideal site for a conference like this, and I'd like to especially thank the outstanding scholars who have come from far and wide to participate in the three days here. So what a spectacular and exciting event we have, and an exciting conclusion of these three days to have Texas native Eva Longoria uh, as our keynote speaker. Golden Globe nominated, Screen Actors Guild award winning, and Alma award-winning actress, producer, businesswoman, and philanthropist. You will know her as Gabriela Solis on the ABC mega-hit and award-winning Desperate Housewives. That's not a surprise to you, is it? She was named the highest paid TV star in 2011 by Forbes magazine. Yet this is not uh, for those accomplishments that we've invited her to be with us on campus today. Eva Longoria has been an advocate to causes important to her heart and to the community for many years. She was recently named Philanthropist of the Year by the Hollywood Reporter. Eva came from a family of volunteers, some of whom are here today, some of her family members are here, and she's always had a drive to make the world a better place. Through her charity, Eva's Heroes. She provides an after-school program for individuals with developmental disabilities, and she provides additional resources for the families. She sheds light on Latino families affected by cancer through her work with Padres Contra el Cancer, or Parents Against Cancer, providing these families with educational, financial, and language resources. In addition, in her documentary, Harvest, Eva is bringing recognition to the plight of an estimated 500,000 mostly Latino children between the ages of five and 16 who work in this country in fields picking our fruits and vegetables. In recognition of Eva's record of blazing trails and political change and employment on behalf of Latinos, empowerment, pardon me, on behalf of Latinos, President Obama appointed her as a commissioner for the National Museum of the Latino, American Latino Commission. And recently, she's uh, been selected as his co-chair for the, uh, for the uh, re-election campaign, the Obama uh, campaign for re-election. She also works closely with the United Farm Workers and the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, and the National Council of La Raza. She is an executive producer and host of Alma Awards and producer and director of the film Latinos Living the American Dream, which showcases how Latinos are reshaping the American landscape. Eva is currently in her last year of graduate school working on her master's degree in Chicano studies and political science, writing her thesis on Latina education. Eva, 
She'll be out here in a second. But let me just say, as she walks out, we admire your giving and caring approach to life, and we're very thankful that you're here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Eva LaGuardia. <laughs> I just love to make you say as many Spanish words as possible. <laughs> we have a standing Aww. ovation. Ah, yay! I applaud you. Oh my God, this is short. No, 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 sit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna raise this. Can I raise this? Oh, okay, so let me, while, you, while you're standing, let me say you saw me walk up here <laughs> with this longhorn hat. Oh, God, is that for so, me? So I didn't bring it up here to wear it. I, I uh, gave it, uh, I brought it up here to have a small token of appreciation, a longhorn gift for Eva Longoria. Oh, so, thank you. Eva Longoria. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my God, that was just fun to see how many Spanish words he could say. <laughs> yeah? Padres, contra el cancer, national council, la raza. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes? OK, good. Uh, first of all, I'd love to thank Charlie and uh, Domino for inviting me here today on behalf of the, Laza the Lozano Long Institute for Latin American Studies, or LILAS, because us Latinos, we like acronyms, right? And NCLR, MALDEF, I love it. I just got off a plane um, a couple hours ago because we were shooting Desperate Housewives till 6 in the morning. So if I'm a little loopy, it's I'm not drunk. It's that I'm really tired. Um, the other thing was, um, I, I, I came here because I was invited to be here. This is my home state, which I'm so honored to be able to be here and speak at UT, and so honored. Because I remember when I was younger, I wanted to go to UT, and, and um, I didn't think it was possible, and I wanted to stay closer to home, and um, so I ended up going to a and I, which became a and M. I I know. <laughs> I know. I'm supposed to do this, not that, right? I don't know. But um, I um, was just excited to come back home. But tomorrow, I get another flight tomorrow because I'm going to be at an event in Los Angeles that um, the Mexican-American community is receiving an apology from the state of California for the uh, repatriation event in the 1930s in the Great Depression when Mexican-Americans were uh, deported. And uh, so we are getting an official apology from the state of California. So I'll be there in the morning, which is really great. Um, I was excited to know that this conference was uh, focusing on how uh, LILAS revolutionizes uh, the study of, of democracies and social injustices and cultural agency, because that's what I'm studying now in my, in my last degree, in my last semester of my master's program. And so I kind of want to speak to that today and give you my testimonial. Uh, about cultural agency and what that means um, and how uh, exploring your agency um, when labels are applied to us, right? Labels uh, uh, are just given to us and sometimes we have no participation in the label choice. Um, but we all should recognize that the character of Latinos is changing in America. The landscape of America is changing in a very Latin way, politically, economically, culturally. Um, but I think we have to think about what these changes mean for our community uh, and what it means about the complex relationship between Latinos and the United States. And uh, I find a lot of people are scared of this change, right? Why are people scared of this change? Where is the xenophobia coming from? I mean, they think there's going to be a Taco Bell in every corner. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't understand it, and I want to. this is why I love speaking to an audience like this who's pretty well versed in these topics and this uh, discussion. Um, but I think we also have to think about who has to gain from the fear of this xenophobia. Who is, who is to gain from this? Um, and where are we going as a community? So I'm going to ask you really quick, how many Mexican Americans do we have in the audience? Woo woo, Mexican Americans, yes. How many Mexicans do we have in the audience? <laughs> See, the, the loud ones, yeah. Uh, how many Tejanos? See, how many Chicanos? Yeah. How many Latinos? Puerto Ricans? No, oh, OK. <laughs> Guatemalans? Yes. Nicaraguans? Oh, God, there's everybody. Spaniards? You! Joder, Dio. 
Yes? <laughs> No, I just wanted to do that because, you know, some of these labels are overlapping, right? I'm Mexican-American, but I'm also Mexicano. I guess I'm Mexicano. I guess I, I am Chicano, and I'm, I'm Tejano. So one of the biggest things that divides us is labels. And it divides us as Americans, as a race, as, a, as an ethnicity. And all the labels are meant to help us navigate uh, through the American process. Labels also dictate our social positions in society, right? To assimilate, to, to acculturate. But what happens when these labels are used in a negative way, in a way that groups us together into something we're not? So examples are documented, undocumented, middle class, lower class, urban, rural, black, white, brown. The labels are usually binary also. There's one good side and there's a bad side. So a good example of this is, is what's happening in, um, with the debate on immigration reform, what's happening in Arizona, the attacks on ethnic studies in colleges across the country. There's a very dangerous rhetoric that is happening that makes assumptions about us as a group, okay? So they assume that immigration immediately means illegal immigration, or that having dark skin means you're foreign, or people of Mexican-American descent means from Mexico or not from here. And being a ninth generation Texan, um, it angers me. These assumptions anger me all the time, but they also inspire me to educate others and educate non-Hispanics and educate the rest of the nation that we are not a monolith, monolithic group. We're not foreign. We Latinos, specifically Mexican Americans, have one of the oldest histories in the United States that started long before 1848, right? So, yeah. So, that's my little rant. But, um, I, I just wanted to share some defining moments in my life that kind of showed me who I was or who I thought I was, or labels that were put on me that I really didn't have a participation in. So I'll tell you about my identity crisis. Um, that's what I like to call it. Um, the first moment I remember about growing up, I grew up on a, on a ranch in um, South Texas, um, in Encino. Yay, South Texas, Valparias, Encino. I want to say also my parents are here. Mom and dad are right there. <laughs> and my sister is here, and she's terrified I'm going to say a story about her, because she was really mean to me growing up. <laughs> so, and she lives in Austin, so. Um, no, but I, so we grew up on a ranch, and, and back then, uh, really close to the border, and back then you could cross the border, you could go to Matamoros or Reynosa without identification. And we would go all the time, we would go for lunch, we would go get medicine, we would go get piñatas for somebody's quinceañera. Um, and I just remember all you needed was 35 cents and a confident answer when the Border Patrol asked, American citizen? And I clearly remember my dad always saying, be sure you say American citizen when we cross. And so me and my sister, we'd like literally skip across the border with our dime and our quarter to put in the turnstile. And we'd shout out, American citizen! And we'd just cross over. And even though I was too young to under fully understand the privilege it was to be an American, I just remember that the word was special because it, it, it was like a secret password that opened the door, that opened the gate. And as long as I said, American, I didn't have to wait in the long line in the Texas heat. <laughs> and, and being young, that was enough for me. I thought, cool, I'm American. I'm American. Um, and then in third grade, all my sisters were very smart, gifted, and talented, and I wasn't. Um, but in third grade, my mom made me take the gifted and talented test. And uh, I went to a, a school in Corpus Christi, born and raised in Corpus Christi. And um, I lived in a predominantly Hispanic community. And I loved my street, because my street was full of the kids that went to my school. We walked to elementary together. They looked like me. They sounded like me. So in third grade, when my mom had me tested for the gifted and talented program, it meant that I would have to switch schools. I would have to switch neighborhoods. I would have to ride a bus. I'd never ridden a bus to school um, in an area of town I'd never been in. And I passed. Uh, the test. I remember um, my mom was really excited, my family was really excited, but I was so sad because I knew I was going to leave my friends and my old school. And so I remember the first day of school, I boarded a school bus for the first time. And I looked at the kids and I noticed none of them looked like me. Not only was their skin different, but their clothes were different, their hair was different, they sounded different. And I'll never forget all the kids on the bus with their Pop-Tarts and their breakfast bar and me with my bean taco, <laughs> or like my warm tortilla with butter. And I was like, what are you guys eating? <laughs> this is, I usually eat what I'm eating. 
And it was the first time I felt Mexican. And I grew up as American as apple pie. I mean, I love Cyndi Lauper and Madonna and Duran Duran, and I know I'm aging myself, but I didn't even speak Spanish. So I, I never thought my old school was inferior until I attended a good school, right? So it was obvious that at this school, I was the Mexican. And then I moved to LA. And uh, I, gradu I graduated college and, uh, with my bachelor's degree in education. And I decided, what better way to waste my mom, my mom and my dad's money than to be an actress? Um, <laughs> and they're like, we paid for four years of college, and you're going to do what? Um, but I was in luck, because I went to LA, and I arrived at the time where the Latin explosion was happening, and Ricky Martin was shaking his bonbon, and Jennifer Lopez was a made in Manhattan. And um, everybody in Hollywood was like jumping on this Latin bandwagon, right? And I remember going. Um, to audition after audition, and all the casting directors telling me, oh my god, that was so great. Um, but can you do it with an accent? And I was like, um, or, or you're really pretty, but you really sound too articulate for the Latin part. Or, oh my god, that was really great, my favorite one. It was like, oh, that was so great. Can you do a little more Latin? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> can you do it a little more Jewish? I mean, like, I, <laughs> I. <laughs> I didn't know, I was like, I don't understand what you, I don't understand what you, what you think Latin is or what you think Mexican is. And uh, I remember them saying, you know, do it more like Rosie Perez. And I was like, okay, I'm not Puerto Rican and I'm not from New York, but I'll try. Um, and the best was when uh, E! News, E! News was hiring, E! In Español was hiring for a new host. And I didn't speak Spanish, but the host had to speak Spanish and I was like, you know what, I can do that. It's reading a teleprompter. I can read Spanish. And so I go to the audition, and I look great, and I'm reading the teleprompter. And so after I'm done, the casting guy looks at me, and he goes, you don't speak Spanish, do you? <laughs> I was like, hola, me llamo Eva. And they were like, oh my god, you don't speak Spanish. And I was like, oh, I could have got this. Um, so it turns out I wasn't Mexican enough, right, when I went to Hollywood. So luckily, my last name sounded Italian, Longoria, right? Um, so the first roles I got in LA were playing Italians. I played you know, a couple of Italians. And after, after obviously many years, I landed the great role of, of Desperate Housewives, um, which was the most significant thing in my life. But I remember I was really lucky because the Solises on Desperate Housewives were the most affluent couple on Wisteria Lane. They were the richest people on the block. And I remember Mark Cherry, who created Desperate Housewives, said, um, ABC asked him, you should change that couple to African American because nobody will believe they're the richest, the Mexicans are the richest ones on the block. And Mark Cherry said, no, I'm not going to change it. They need to be Hispanic because he grew up with the Solises on his street in, where he grew up. And he always remembered that the Mexicans were the richest people on the block. <laughs> and I, I always I applauded Mark for that because he stuck to his guns and he said, I'm not going to change it to African American. We, should, we need to have more um, uh, Hispanics on TV. Um, so then the last rude awakening of my like, identity crisis was um, all my life I've been so proud to be Mexican American. I'm like, soy Mexicana de corazón. I'm so excited. And I also think I was like an Aztec princess in my past life. Um, <laughs> So I was invited to be on this PBS show with Dr. Henry Louis Gates um, called American Lives. And they, uh, they reveal your gene genealogy through DNA testing. And I was like, this is great. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Somebody's going to finally confirm I was an Aztec princess. Um, and so they give us the results. And my parents are there, and everybody was there. And I was so shocked to find out, not only was I not Mexican, I was 75% Spanish and European. And the 25% of the indigenous I had in me was Mayan. And I was like, I'm not Aztec. <laughs> you see my room, my, my whole house is like Aztec stuff. Now I have to switch it to Mayan. Um, <laughs> I'm like, wait, so not only am I not Aztec, I'm Mayan, and I'm a Spaniard. So I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. We are the bad people that came to Mexico. And I mean, I was a mess. Um, and then to make matters worse, I was dating a Spaniard at the time, and I was learning Spanish, and he would always make fun of my Spanish. He's like, it's not carro, it's coche, and it's not ahorita, it's ahora. And I'm like, shut up! Um, and we literally had daily fights about the conquest in Cortez. Um, so the headache went on and on and on, and so I finally um, was you know, still kind of navigating 
like, who am I? What is this? What does this mean? And then I decided to go back to get uh, my master's degree, go back to school, get my master's degree in Chicano studies, not fully knowing what a Chicano was. I never even heard of the word Chicano because I'm from Texas. I was like, soy Texana. Um, what does this word mean? Uh, but I did know it was, it was this field of study that was really speaking to me. And it, I read a book called Occupied America by Rudy Acuna. And it changed my life. It changed how I looked at history. It changed how I looked at um, uh, who tells the story, how they tell the story, why the story is told. And whether it's called Chicano studies or Mexican American studies or Latin American studies, it's all an effort to better understand where we came from, who we are, and where we want to go as a community. So I always find that I, you know, with the, with the census that came out and, and the explosion of numbers and, and Latinos are the fastest growing um, group in, in America, it's time for Latinos to stop being a number and start being a market. To, to stop being the largest minority in the United States and to start being the most influential group in the United States, right? This, um, so it's funny because this educational journey and experience is really what I'm most proud of. My mas the master's program at Cal State Northridge, the oldest one in the country, um, really is the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life. And um, when this Forbes list came out, what he mentioned, um, and it announced I was the highest paid woman in television, not Latina, not, you know, not, not and by ethnicity, I was the highest paid woman in television. And I go, I was like, me? I am? And I went to class at night, because I have classes on Tuesdays and Wednesdays or Thursdays, depending on the day. And so I'm filming all day on Desperate Housewives, and then I go to school. And I actually go to school, and I have a backpack. People make fun of me. And um, my, one of my classmates was like, it, it was viral. That thing went everywhere. And, and they list your salary, so everybody knew what I made. And I was really embarrassed, because I like to be normal in school. And the guy, my classmate goes, why are you here? <laughs> and I was, I was like, this to me is so much more important. I always knew that the end goal of my journey in life was not to be famous, was not to be an actress. Um, I feel like I haven't even tapped into the potential I have as a human being. Um, so people would look at me and go, you're so successful. And I said, I, yes, by a certain measure, of course. But by my measure, or by the measure that my family puts, puts me to, I still have a lot more work to do. So when it comes to my identity, I found out over the years that I've just constantly negotiated my position in my space um, as a Latino, as a woman. And I've built my own cultural wealth by discovering my roots, by exploring my history, and by continuing to stay curious about the world. I'm extremely curious, and I want to know everything. Um, and I always say my identity is, is uh, what it always lives in what Gloria Anzaldúa calls Napantla the transition, right, the, the in-between state. You're neither here nor there. I'm not only Mexican or American. I'm, I'm straddling that hyphen that joins the two. I went to uh, France to learn French. I went to Spain to learn Spanish. I, I love to build my own cultural economy, my own identity, and I do that through education. So I don't think that the idea of Chicano studies or Mexican-American studies is to reclaim or revise, I think it's to recognize what's already there. And when you recognize what's already there, you can tap into the potential of the community, of our community, and what we have to offer. So this um, epiphany of, of my journey of identity has led me to create the Eva Longoria Foundation, which is um, focusing on helping Latinas in education and entrepreneurship. Um, to better themselves and to better their lives or their families through uh, programs that will help them finish not only high school, but higher education, and then give them opportunity and capital to start businesses. You know, Latinas make an average of 54 cents to every dollar a white man makes. And that's less than any other ethnic or gender group that, um, any, any other group. And Latinas open businesses at six times the national rate. So we're entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, but we're not um, working smart, we're working hard. And so that's what I'm hoping to change with the Eva Longoria Foundation. Um, the last thing I'll say is, as uh, I know because we're gonna have a fun talk now, a fun Q&A. Uh, I often say we don't need diversity in America, we need diversity of thought and diversity in ideology. Um, everyone is, is familiar with historical slavery, but I find that there's a new kind of slavery and that's being enslaved in your mind 
And we can't empower others to misinterpret our culture, to misinterpret our history or our intelligence. So I think it's great that you guys are here because you know who I am, but I think it's more important that you know who you are. Um, your journey here at school and out in life is very important, and your testimonials will change the stereotypes and generalizations that media and society make, or that history has recorded about Hispanics, about Latinos, about Mexicanos. So we Latinos should be concerned with how our story is told and who is telling it. And we need to tell our own story. So through each and every one of you here, we have the ability to disassemble that historical context that has excluded our voice. And the greatest lesson, lesson I've ever learned, and I read it in um, a black feminist theory book, was to be, um, it's important for us to be rooted in our, in our culture, but not constrained by it. So that's my two cents about my identity crisis. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I hope that helps. I hope that helps inspire some of you guys to uh, not only continue your education, but um, once you once you have it, to go out in the world and give back to us, to our community. Um, I think we're going to do a Q and A now. Yes, with you. Yay! Are we sitting? There's no wine. No. <laughs> you really want to get me to talk? Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. It's interesting to hear you mention the influence of Rudy Acuna's book. Mm -hmm. so I hope we can talk about that. Yeah. So, but um, a couple of things. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words, your generosity, your inspiration. I appreciate that. I, in the provost's introduction, he gave us a list of the many organizations with which you work. And in your speech, you too cited some of them. But I want to list them so people have a clear sense of the various causes to which Eva is devoted. Um, the United Farm Workers, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, MALDEF, we like our acronyms, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, the National Council of La Raza, and uh, particularly Padres Contra el Cancer, uh, the Eva Longoria Foundation, and Eva's Heroes. Discuss, if you would, how philanthropy mm -hmm. and activism have shaped your personal perspective and professional oh, wow. perspective. Yeah, it's, um, it really shaped who I was. You know, I grew up with a special needs sister. She's not here today, but um, she has a mental disability. So we were a very selfless family. So I was born into her world, and I was born into volunteerism. My mom was a special education teacher. My sister's a special education teacher. Um, and our whole life always revolved around Lisa. What could Lisa do? Where could Lisa go? Um, and so I, I used to think volunteer was a job because we did it so much. I was like, I have a job. I'm a volunteer. Um, and so it was ingrained in me really early. I had also an aunt who was very philanthropic. She passed away, but um, she always made us donate clothes and go to the senior citizen center and serve Thanksgiving. Um, to you know the homeless, and I always go ah, and then looking back, I go oh my gosh, those were lessons that I could never have imagined. Mm -hmm. um, but in in regards to what I pick and why I pick it, mm -hmm. I think um, there's I've been very strategic with my philanthropy, um, and it's very dangerous as an actor to be very vocal. You can be very polarizing. So if I'm too vocal about being Latino, then people won't go see my movie. If I'm too vocal about Obama, then people won't go see my show. And I find that there are things way more important than that. You know, I'd rather be vocal about women's rights and women's reproductive rights than, than, uh, than any box office. You know, um, I've been really blessed with um, the success of the show that I'm at a place where I can do that. MALDEF is a litigious, I'm on the board of MALDEF, and it's a litigious arm of the Latino community, which I'm very proud of. You know, if you screw with us, we'll sue you. Um, but it could be polarizing because they do go after, you know, big people. Um, and, but I'm very proud of them. I'm proud of what they do. I'm proud of, um, you know, they were the first to jump on board in Arizona. Uh, you know, of course, SB 1070 was very dangerous, but the, 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 the second bill which went under the radar was the ban of ethnic studies. And I, I, I just you know, was going, why isn't anybody talking about this? Why isn't anybody making a bigger deal about this? And I remember people telling me, stay out of it, because it's a very dangerous um, 
topics and you could be, you know, really alienating some of your fans. And I said, I, this is, I, I can't, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm pretty vocal. Um, and then um, padres, I've always, you know, there's a disproportionate link to uh, children and cancer, uh, Latinos and children with cancer. And so padres is an organization that helps Latino families navigate the process of, of having a child with cancer, which um, is often done in a language that they don't understand. I mean, it would be like if you went to China and had cancer and had to understand that. So um, that, that led me also to um, farm workers in Dolores and um, the documentary I produced called Harvest um, about child farm workers because there's so many kids in the field that are getting sprayed by these toxic pesticides and the cancer for children, farm workers in the fields are three, four times the amount of a normal child. So there's a correlation and, and there's all of this, all of my philanthropy kind of ties together and, and it's really um, very strategic. I really want things to overlap and each arm to help each other. Mm -hmm. Just before we proceed, I think that um, you want <laughs> Is it, did you flip it off? You want mine? <laughs> you got it? No. I can't to undo mine. Speak into my. <laughs> He's going to go. Thank you. Is it on? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very generous offer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you brought up Arizona in your speech, mm -hmm. and you brought up um, the attack on ethnic studies. So I, I want to follow up on a question with that. So what do you think is the importance of ethnic studies? And I think I know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But how can we work to defend its preservation? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, it's another because of the, the dialogue that's happening in the country right now about immigration, mm -hmm. they assume ethnic studies um, fosters this anti-American um, rhetoric against America mm -hmm. um, when it, it's proven to, to do the opposite. The kids that attend the Mexican-American studies programs in Arizona um, have a higher rate of not dropping out because they're engaged in curriculum. Things are speaking to them. Um, and uh, I find that people are strategically leaking misinformation about ethnic studies, just like Occupied America. I, I was carrying Occupied America because I had the class. And I was paparazzied, and um, some, I got so many responses to this, that book. And I was like, what's wrong with the book? I think it's great. That's, I love that book. And I didn't realize um, you know, how polarizing Chicano studies could be. And, and, and I thought, that's, I never saw it like that. I didn't see it like that. And so, um, ethnic studies is dangerous because it just starts getting into um, infringing upon our rights to, to study. If I want to study the Holocaust, you cannot stop me. So why are you just banning the study of Mexican-American studies, but nothing else? And so um, I think you have to listen you know, and be aware. Um, even whenever all these reports came out during Arizona, I've been to Arizona three times uh, when everything happened. I went. Uh, I always like to go to the heart of the problem. I want to understand it myself. I went to Arizona. I uh, went uh, in a helicopter over the desert. I went to the border. I went to the fence. I crossed the fence. I went to the other side. I was on the Mexico side. I talked to farm workers crossing every day. I was on the American side talking to farmers who need the farm workers. I went to the city morgue who's overflowing with uh, bodies that are just dying in the desert. I went to the border patrol, spoke to them. I mean, I really saw every side of this immigration. And it was amazing um, that the amount of humanity each group had. The border patrol is not a villain. They were very sympathetic, but they're villainized in the press. Um, uh, the farmers are villainized for hiring immigrants. And they, when we know economically their, their, their um, businesses would fail without this labor force, the um, people crossing over are not drug lords. They're moms um, who wake up every morning 
at, this woman wakes up at one in the morning, it takes her two hours to get to the border. She has to stay in line for two hours, gets her day visa, waits at five o'clock in the morning, starts work at six, ends at seven or eight at night, goes back, takes an hour to cross back, and she does it all over again every day. That is not a dangerous person to society. I would love for her to contribute to the economy of the United States, you know? So, I, I just think um, it's, it's, you got to really think about who is saying it, why are they saying it, and who benefits from this being said. Yeah. Absolutely. I have a list of other questions that I'd like to ask you, but I know we're running short on time. No, and I would really, we're fine. I would really love to give the opportunity for uh, our, um, students? our students and uh, our staff and, and faculty who uh, participated in the Facebook competition to ask you questions. Oh, there was a competition? There was a competition. <laughs> and so we have a, a series of questions. And our first question is going to be from uh, John Gonzalez. And he's an associate professor in the Department of English and the Center for Mexican American Studies. Okay. John? Hello. Well, welcome back to Texas. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be back. I came too late for breakfast tacos. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, never too late. Oh, is there a 24 hour taco place? <laughs> always, we'll have to get There's always a taco you. place. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you envision your role in advancing Latino and Latina causes? And uh, why do you think this kind of advocacy by high profile media figures is important? Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because high profile people usually get criticized for being philanthropic or being activists. They're like, shut up, Sean Penn, who cares about Haiti? And you're like, like really? Like, <laughs> you know, something horrible happened in Haiti. Good thing that he's doing that. Um, and uh, I remember I was on, um, I was on Piers Morgan, and he asked me about immigration reform, and I said, I'm not the expert, but I'm very literate on the topic, so I will tell you my opinion on it. Um, and you know, there was some obviously backlash from the right, going, "What is? She, why are we listening to her?" And I, and I always say, because I'm an American citizen. If I was a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, I would have the same opinion. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that I have a voice uh, to be an advocate. Um, I was just named one of the co-chairs for the Obama campaign. So, so to answer your question of how can I help advance. <laughs> I forget we're in Austin. <laughs> I tread lightly. I'm on the Obama campaign? Yay! Um, and, um, I was, I'm really proud because he really, you know, I know there's a disappointment in the Latino community um, for not tackling immigration reform. You know, he had, he had his, uh, the DREAM Act, I, absolutely. There's a lot of things and he's been, um, you know, it's been tough. Um, immigration reform has been on the national agenda for the last three administrations. So when people try to, you know, put Obama's a scapegoat for that. Two, get the Latino vote. And this is what I'm saying, do not be deceived by misinformation, and you have to be really, so I'm, I'm excited to be on the, on the campaign because um, I'm gonna be able to get the messaging out to the Latino community um, regarding the facts and everything he's done and what he's going to do, and I'm gonna be on his ass making sure that he's listening to us, you know? So it's both. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from a student, Divya Suneha, and she is in the Latin American Studies program and also biochemistry. Nice. Divya? Um, hi, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question was, in your opinion, who is someone who's made a profound impact on the Latino community in the past five years and why? In the past five years? This is an interesting subject. I actually did like a 40-page paper on where are the Chicana activists today because there was this amazing movement in, in the 60s. Dolores Huerta, Antonio Hernandez, Gloria Molina, uh, uh, um, so many women, uh, not only women, obviously men as well, who um, were part of this amazing movement. And a lot of the gains we've made as a Latino community uh, during the civil rights movement have been dismantled. And so where is that generation now? Who is that person? Um, and I always ask this question and people go, you. I'm like, no, 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 aside from me, where is that person? Where's the Dolores Huerta of today? Um, you know, Dolores continues to, to fight the fight. Rudy continues to fight the fight, uh, Rudy Acuna. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say it, they're here in this room. 
you know. I hope they're here in this room. <laughs> they better be here in this room. Yes, I answered your question. Okay, good. Our second student question is from Larissa Uribe, and she's International Relations and Global Studies. Thank you for coming. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I'm so happy to be here. My question is, what is the best advice you have received and given? Oh, um, the best, re best advice I ever got was from my parents, and they said, never forget where you came from. Um, yeah, they remind me every day that I'm Mexican. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But no, they did. And, and to get an education, they really were big on education um, and getting an education. It was really assumed that uh, we would all go to college. Um, and um, the, the other best advice I got was reading. Um, I, re I, I, I read a lot. I devour books. And um, the, um, the book by Toure, and he's the African-American scholar who wrote Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness. Um, and I read a lot of African-American civil rights books because it should parallel. It paralleled and it should parallel. And the community should unite. Because when I talk about farm workers, um, so I like to understand their theories. Black feminist theory is amazing. If you read black feminist theory, it's really, uh, you know, ap applicable to our to our plight. Um, and also, um, so in his book, Two Ray's book, which just came out, he, he's the one that said, "Do not be constrained by blackness. Um, you can be rooted in being African American, but don't be constrained by it." And I was like, "That is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard anybody say." Because as Latinos, we think. There's a glass ceiling that we put upon ourselves. I can't go to college. I'm never going to have a career. I'll get a job. I'll get married. I'll have kids. And um, you're restricting yourself because of your culture, because of what you think our culture expects from you, especially as women, especially as Latinas. We're a schizophrenic culture being Latina because we want to be true to our culture. We want to be the mom and we want to be the wife, but yet we want to be professionals and we want to have our own career. We want to be breadwinners as well. So how does that change the dynamic of families? How does that change the dynamic of child rearing? In a Latino family, how does that change machismoism? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's definitely uh, problem problematic for us, but I think um, you should never be constrained by it. So that was the other great advice that I got. What advice I give? I give advice all the time. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think you got a lot of it in my speech. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And our final question is from Alex Rea Torvar, and he's a community member. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi. Uh, my question is sort of redundant a little bit since you answered it, but let's visit it again more profoundly. I was, um, I was struck in watching your participation, Faces of America, with Henry Gates, mm -hmm. on how you were somebody before the testing, who you were, and then after the testing, I was wondering how your identity changed, and, and you sort of touched on that. Yeah. But you know, Latino families have such myths about who we are. Yeah. So can we you? Are, yeah, and we also romanticize the conquest or um, the uh, origins. And it's funny because um, our identity is always rooted in, in origins. I mean, uh, and or, your origin story is different. I mean, even if you think about the origin of the earth, do you believe in Adam and Eve? Do you believe in Big Bang? Do you believe in creation? Do I, like, what do you believe? And depending on that origin story dictates your trajectory. And so my origin story had always been, we're Texans. We're Texans. I mean, we came here from somewhere. I'm assuming Spain-ish. <laughs> um, and my dad would always say that. He's like, we're Spanish. And I was like, dad, we're Mexican. Um, and at what point does the mestizaje come in and, and um, the new culture is formed, right? So um, I went to this exhibit at LACMA in, in LA, the Los Angeles County Museum, and it was called Contested Visions. And it was Spanish colonial art and Mayan and Incan and Aztec art in the same time period, documenting the same thing in very different ways. So obviously you had a religious uh, colonial factor with the Spanish art, and it was beautiful, and you go, wow. And they said, everybody was Christian, was baptized, and it was beautiful. And then you have the pictures of the Mayans going, rah! Um, <laughs> but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that 
one was necessarily wrong in their, in their vision of it. I mean, some of it, obviously, religiously, they wanted to make certain statements. But if you look at just artists of, of what they saw at that time, and what the Mayans saw at that time, or the Aztecs saw at that time, they're contested visions. And they will always be contested, right? Because um, I dated a Spaniard, and literally every day we were like, ah! Um, and so for me, it, it jarred me for a second because I didn't realize I was that. I knew I was, had Spanish blood. I didn't know it was the majority of my blood. Um, but then again, I just, I just uh, embrace being Mexicana so much that I don't think any blood test could have changed my view of myself. Yeah? Does that yeah. make sense? Thanks. Yeah. And you didn't address the Chinese part. <laughs> Huh? Weren't you related to Yo-Yo Ma at the end? Well, no, because you know, indigenous blood, it's interesting. Um, the indigenous blood, which is Native American, is called Asian blood because of the Bering Strait. And because, so, so when you get a blood test, you'll have Asian blood if you're Mayan, or, and it says Asian. Um, so we shared an ancestor, Yo-Yo Ma and I, in the last 100 years. And I'm 3% African American. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yes, I'm part of everybody. <laughs> we have time for one last question. So you're an inspiration for a new generation of young Latinos, especially in Texas. Many of them who are in this room right here and many of whom you called out. Um, what message of encouragement do you have for them to take a stronger role in the political future of Latinos in America? Ooh. I know. Um, people always ask me if I'm going to get involved in politics. Um, and, I, and I usually say, not as a politician. Um, and I find some people, uh, especially women, especially Latinas, are, are shy away from, from being politically involved. Um, and so I think that's really, if we are not civically engaged, we do not have a voice. Um, and, and there's going to be this huge apathy within the Latino community, particularly with this campaign. Uh, because people are frustrated, and specifically Latinos, oh, we didn't do anything, and oh, blah. And that is so dangerous. And so as, as little ambassadors in this room, each and every one of you has to outreach and has to say, go out there and vote. I don't, I don't mean, I, don't, I do care who you vote for. But I mean, uh, just you have to be civically engaged and have a voice, especially women, because so many people fought so hard for us to have the right to vote. And if you don't, take advantage of that privilege, you're just disrespecting everything that came before you. And so I think that would be my advice um, politically, is, is to be civically engaged is very easy. It's not as overwhelming as you think. You don't have to be rich and famous and um, a celebrity to be, to be um, political. You can be um, political in, in every way. Every, every day you can, you can be political. I, I said this story the other day. I was speaking at USC. And every day, you know, what do you call the thing when you drink coffee? The, the sauce, is it a saucer? Saucer. saucer. I don't know why. I, I, I can't drink coffee enough saucer. And I, and I drink my coffee and I put the saucer away. And then the waiter will come and he'll put it back on the saucer. And I take it off. And my professor said, is that your protest to colonization? <laughs> and I go, it is. Because I didn't grow up with saucers. Do you know what I mean? So to yeah. me, it was odd that you put this thing. And it is colonial. I mean, it is that. And I said, it is my, it's my, so every day I do a protest to colonialization <laughs> with my coffee. And I feel good. Because <laughs> it's not cup and saucer, it's cup and mesa. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, on, the beh on behalf of the Center for Mexican American Studies and for Lilas, we would like to. Yes. Uh, and the dreamers. Hi, dreamers. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, i just like to thank you for coming out here. Um, and you asked a question earlier, who are the Dolores Huertas of today? And I'd just like to say that they're sitting right there. They are. Um, those are the, the, the brave women that founded the organization that we are part of in, uh, at UT. Mm -hmm. And um, you've talked about civic engagement, and that's uh, everything that we do. Mm -hmm. But now. here's the interesting thing. Where, where are you from? Um, I'm actually an undocumented immigrant. I'm from uh, Nepal. Right. From where? From Nepal. So here's the thing, is un, you're undocumented, right? And you are more civically engaged than most Americans. Right. 
That. This is the potential. This is why the DREAM Act is so important, is because we have this untapped resource within our borders, right, within our borders, and we're pushing them out. I don't understand the logic behind that. I don't understand. This is why I am very democratic. If you, if you hear the GOP, uh, all of, the, um, all of the, the debates about the DREAM Act, I, Romney says I would veto it the first day I'm in office. What is wrong with educating this amazing resource of women, of men, of young minds who want to be engaged in the community, contribute to society, contribute as Americans, and you want to say, no, I don't understand that. I will not understand that when it comes to that side of, of the campaign. And that's one thing that um, I'm really going to push on. Right. And please remind President Obama, because, I mean, you know under his administrations what's happened to dreamers and undocumented mm -hmm. immigrants. And yes. Because now, now, in Texas, because cause it got wonky during when Rick Perry was running, right? Yeah. Because he did something great, <laughs> and then he pulled it back. So, OK, because I thought Texas was doing good. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was going to do it. But you know, in California, we passed our DREAM Act. We passed our DREAM Act, so. I mean. I told it. Yeah. And, um, and Texas and California should, they, they need to be on par with each other. And they need, it's, it's yeah, yeah, the, it's the demographics are exact. They reflect the 37% exact demographics. And, um, and I, I particularly, you know, obviously have a, um, I'm, I, my heart is deep in the heart of Texas, and so for me, this is a, a very, very important uh, um, initiative that I'm going to absolutely be working on. Yeah, and I mean, thank you, and just please remind them because more deportations have, have have been under President Obama than ever. So absolutely, and just thank you for coming out. Yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Again. guys. On behalf of the Center for Mexican American Studies and Limas, thank you so much for being here and sharing your thoughts with us and thank for you answering all. our questions. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you.